So I'm thinking in my car the other day. The big thing I needed to do was kind of find my crowd, I guess, is the way to put it. Say this podcast for me is like going to a party filled with artists and mingling, which is awesome. I mean, talking shop, getting ideas and inspiration from each other. Last week when I met Ben's story, we talked about Amazon Prime Video. And I think I'll use that as my next promotional project. You see, I have a short animated series that I did called The Adventures of Xylus and Dexter. So I put that up on Amazon Prime Video, and I'm going to focus solely on that, like I did with my comics, see what I might learn from it, see what shakes out. Do I make any interesting discoveries, and is it the same crowd? Is it a different crowd? That part I kind of like. And once I figure that out, I can let that run in the background, hopefully, and make more comics, make more cartoons. At least that's what I've been trying to work up to this whole time. Make my own stuff and not rely on somebody else. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. And speaking of cartoons, the person that I meet today, I actually met probably in the mid-2000s, I think it was. And he ran a podcast called The Radio Adventures of Dr. Floyd. And I actually animated a cartoon for him. And that's how we met. Hello, my name is Grant Pachoco, and I am a puppeteer with Mystery Science Theater 3000 and the Jim Henson Company, and I'm also a podcaster. Grant actually does so much. He's a writer. He's been in so many things, including Puppeteer for the Can in the Wet Hot American Summer series that was released on Netflix not too long ago. He was involved in the Happy Time Murders movie. He's got several shows online, and he also is an announcer for Championship Wrestling. And that's only really to name a few things. Like, I'm always amazed by what he does. So as I've said, I've known him for years, but here's the funny thing. We've never actually met face to face until just this year when I went to Chicago to see the Mystery Science Theater 3000 tour. And my wife and I went to the meet and greet, so really we only got to meet him for like a minute because he was doing the puppet for Crow T Robot. So I had my picture taken with the whole cast and Grant was sitting on the ground holding the puppet and that was the first time we ever met. And then I realized when we were in Chicago, you know what? I need to get this guy on the show because him and I should officially talk. Are you still doing stand-up at all? I do occasionally, yeah. I still perform as Throwing Toasters, uh, which was my comedy act. Um, not as much anymore, just because the the kind of the puppetry stuff and working on my own projects has, has uh, taken precedence over that. But uh, every once in a while I do, and a lot of times I'm performing... Uh, there's a, a comedy club here in Burbank, California called Flappers, and they have a show every Saturday afternoon at 4.30 called Two Milk Minimum, which is a family-friendly show. And so a lot of the times I'm performing there, I, I go there and I do uh, funny songs, but they're kid-friendly songs. So uh, not a lot of the Throwing Toaster songs uh, will make it into the set there, but I, I have a lot of like goofy kid songs and stuff I do. So That actually brings up a, something that I've always wondered about and something I still... I guess struggle with, not struggle with, but just kind of realize that I have a clean side and a adult side (laughs) as far as stuff I do. And you do too. You ride that line. You've got, you've got like your uncle interloper, which is like the part of the Saturday morning labeled stuff, Saturday morning Saturday morning media. But then you also have like your toily, your toily, the toilet paper. How do you differentiate those when you, with your followers or do you even have to worry about it? Well, it's interesting because back when I was doing throwing toaster stuff, it was important to me to not swear, to keep it clean and, and kind of walk a line where it's like, whoa, he's really talking about some, you know, like a, the song Debbie. Uh, it's like a stalker song. Yes. And it's not a song for kids, um, but it, it's, a, it's a stalker song. And but I don't swear in that song. Yeah. And, you know, like the worst thing I say is I'll see you in hell, mm-hmm. you know, but like that's that's it. When I was doing stand up a lot, I loved it because I would be at a show and be with the other comics backstage. Then someone come backstage and go, there's a kid in the audience. There's a kid sitting like there's a like a 10 year old kid sitting in the second row. Oh, okay. And I'd be like, oh, okay, because I don't swear in my songs. Yeah. uh, And I I like to think the stuff will go over their head. But what's interesting now, uh, it's actually a little project I'm doing right now. um, And it involves both Uncle Interloper, who you mentioned, and Toilet Tea Paper. For whatever reason, I'm doing these things where they're reading stories. 
and they're reading kids stories. Mm -hmm. And so Uncle Interloper is reading kids stories from the library in these little YouTube videos and on his podcast, and he's just reading them. And he doesn't really necessarily comment on them. He may say a little something on the end, but he's reading it just as if, you know, he was doing storytelling at the library. And then Toily will read the same book and just do horrible comments throughout the whole thing. He's <laughs> yeah. making fun of it. He's, he's, you know, bringing up logic points that are, that are going, you know, he's commenting on the, the artwork or whatever. And I'm not releasing those at the same time and putting them out there, but I'm, uh, they'll be staggered releases, but it's an interesting way to look at the same kind of idea and do two different things with it. Do like a kid-friendly version mm -hmm. and then uh, really let it go and be like, oh, what would Toily say? You know, like uh, the, the one I just filmed yesterday and just edited yesterday is they both read uh, in separate videos, but they read The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. Okay. And Uncle Interloper just reads it as normal, but then Toily's like just commenting the whole time about how horrible the boy is taking all the stuff yeah. from the tree. And for the most part, I, I'd say I'm clean. And Toily is the one thing where I can I can kind of get away with swearing and, and uh, Toily can say things that I, I really can't. I mean, all puppets can do that. <laughs> Toily really, actually the one thing I'm very worried about at Toily is that people start thinking, oh, this is what Grant really thinks. And sometimes that's true. What Toily says is what I think. But a lot of times it's just like, oh, what would this character say in this situation? A lot of people get it. You know, the people who like Uncle Interloper will also watch Toily stuff if they're, you know, I don't push it towards kids. I make more of a bigger deal saying Uncle Interloper's for kids. It's for families. Yeah. It's funny because I asked this question on one of the podcasts I do, Under the Puppet, and I was interviewing John Tartaglia, who was in Avenue Q, and he, uh, he was on Sesame Street, and, mm -hmm. and um, he's, he's a really great guy. And I asked him the same question, and he said... Yeah, but like nowadays, it's you have people who are Saturday Night Live actors doing voices for animated kids shows. Right. So it's like you can do both, you know, and it's like the adults will get that. Oh, this is, you, you know, the adults will enjoy the adult stuff. The kids will enjoy the kids stuff and, and whatever. So that's a long winded answer for your question. <laughs> but there it is. How did you even begin with puppeteering or stand-up? I've always been a, a ham and I was always, even as a kid, I liked, like one of my favorite things was if my parents had friends over and they had kids, I would be the one organizing a show. It's mm. like, okay, after dinner, we're going to do this show and we're going to rehearse the show before dinner. We'll have dinner and then we're going to put on this show for the adults and we're going to make the, and usually it was lip syncing to a song. I, like I can distinctly remember doing a show to Men at Work's Johnny Be Good, uh, not Johnny Be Good, but Johnny Be Good Johnny. Yeah, Be Good Johnny, yeah. Be Good Johnny, yeah. And so like that was one of them. And um, the police's everything she does is magic. And nice. like I had this whole thing of like, it's a witch and uh, the witch is doing this spell and then it's everything she does is magic. You know, like taking it so literally. Okay. I would also record, I had a little red tape recorder, which I actually still have. I'm looking at it right now. I would record myself talking. I would record other people like doing shows into it. As a little, little kid, I mean, I don't know when I got this, but I was little. And um, I would record stuff off of like, Looney Tunes cartoons on Saturday morning mm -hmm. and then like act them out. I was, and as far as the puppets were concerned, I was always a fan of the Muppets. We had a couple local shows in San Francisco where I grew up. Uh, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay area and we had a show called Buster and me and a show called uh, Charlie and Humphrey. And both were on all the time. And as far as I can, I was concerned, you know, they were just as big as the Muppets because mm -hmm. they were on TV and I was, you know, I could, I had no idea they were, being produced locally or not, you know, hmm. whatever. I think I, my grandmother bought me a puppet when I was a kid, but I never had any plans of like, oh, I'm going to be a puppeteer. But it was certainly something I was interested in, always interested in. And when uh, later on, when the opportunity arose and someone said, hey, you want to come try this puppet thing? I was like, yes, uh, I definitely want to do that. Do you make your own puppets? I tried um, like around 2003. I was like, how do you make a puppet? And <laughs> it was before you could go on to YouTube and find a 12 year old in Alabama to tell you. how to. <laughs> so I, I, I remember I ordered a book off the Internet and it came and I I made a few. And that's kind of how I got into puppeteering. But then 
I, I met my my good friend Russ Walco, who I do a lot of projects with. He's the other co-lead puppeteer on Mystery Science Theater 3000, okay. and he's the lead puppeteer on Tom Servo. He is an amazing builder. I mean, Henson hires him, so he's 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 amazing. He he's built for tons of things. He built for this new Dark Crystal series that's coming out. He's amazing, mm. and he's also fast. And once I met him and saw that he could build puppets, I was like. Why would I would rather pay him and then have it done right than for me to take 12 years to figure out how to do it to make it look like how he would make it. So I, I dabbled in it, but I was not very good at it. Okay. And as far as the, the stand up was concerned or, or doing comedy music and stuff is I was all, I was always a fan of Dr. Demento mm -hmm. and Weird Al. I would write song parodies. I went to school for uh, theater. Uh, Cal State Long Beach, and I got a degree in theater and acting, and I moved back to San Francisco after I graduated, and I was like going on auditions and stuff, but nothing was happening, and I was like, I want to perform right now. I don't want to wait for somebody to tell me to perform. How can I do that? Probably at the time, if I would have had like a home video camera and easy editing like we have now on, mm -hmm. on the computer, I would have been making my own videos, but at the time, it was like, oh, I can go to comedy clubs. I can go do stand-up. And oh, so I started okay. putting it together an act uh, like that. I first discovered you when podcasting first came out and you were yeah. doing the radio adventures of Dr. Floyd. Basically I was looking for something like I was just looking for old time radio shows. Cause I'm a huge fan of them and I found your stuff and it was like, this is awesome. And at the same time, it was very well produced. Like, uh, did you have a background in audio editing? You don't just pick that stuff up and put out such a well put together show like that. Well, thank you. I, <laughs> um, I did not, but I was a huge fan of Stan Freeberg, a huge fan of uh, recorded audio like yourself. Not much old time. I didn't get into old time radio shows until later, but very much a fan of audio. And I listening to Dr. Demento all the time and hearing mm. the, you know, he played music, but hearing the the sketches and the songs and, and the things he would play there. And Stan Freeberg was like my ultimate uh, idol. I mean, that, that, I, I'm such, he's such a hero of mine. The whole genesis of Dr. Floyd was, so it must have been Christmas 2003, I got one of the DVD sets of one of the seasons of Rocky and Bullwinkle. And mm -hmm. it might have been even the first season of Rocky and Bullwinkle. And when I was watching it, I had forgotten that the whole show was made up of these little like three or four minute long segments mm -hmm. and then they would you know they would do rocky and bullwinkle and it'd only be like three or four minutes long then it would go to peabody and sherman and then it would go to dudley do right and then it would go back to rocky and bullwinkle to continue the story that you saw and i loved that continuation thing and i was like oh man that's, i didn't realize that they took 80 episodes right uh, to tell one whole story of you know rocky and bullwinkle and the moon men or or whatever it was and and i just love that serialized stuff my friend uh, at the time, Doug Price, and I, actually, I had an idea for a public access show, and he had an idea for a public access show, and we put them together, uh, put all the characters together to create a new public access show. And uh, this, again, was all right before you could edit stuff on your computer. Um, so we were we filmed two episodes at a public access studio. The, the, thing, the problem was that the editing was really cheap and that it was like 50 bucks an hour, which for to, to edit television videotape at the time, that was like an amazing deal, but it was still 50 bucks an hour for two guys who were substitute teachers. Doug paid for most of it because I didn't really have any money that I could put towards it. And Doug was kind of spearheading the project. You know, we did like an episode, you know, we did one and three quarters of an episode and we just ran out of money. It was just like, we don't have money to go edit the rest of this because it's just too diff too, you know, too cost, uh, too expensive. And then in 2003, I got that DVD set and I said, oh, we still have these characters. It, it would be interesting to do like this Rocky and Bullwinkle type thing with these characters, but do it. Uh, and at the time I was hosting an internet radio show and I go, but do it out, you know, over the internet radio show. So in April of 2004, I played the first episode of Dr. Floyd on my internet radio show. What was the internet radio show? There is a station called Dementia Radio and that plays comedy music. Okay. It's just a server that's serving up random comedy music songs, but then people will go on and have their own shows. Okay. Uh, so they, they'll live stream to the radio station. And it was a it was through the comedy music world that I found out about the station. And I used to do a show every Monday 
and that's where I put Dr. Floyd on there. At the time, Doug lived in Florida. Uh, he had lived out here, but he had moved to Florida. It was right around the same time that GarageBand came out for the mm. for Apple computers. And I basically just kind of taught myself, like, okay, how do I do this? You know, uh, GarageBand, if you've, if you've used it, is more or less pretty simple to figure out how, how things work. Yeah, Doug, I would send Doug a script, and, and he would record his lines uh, out, out there and, and then send them out. And so we did that. We did, I think almost two full seasons of Dr. Floyd, I, there was an article in Wired about podcasting. Uh, I believe I believe it was Wired, but it was an article about, about podcasting that I read somewhere on the internet. And as I was reading it, I was like, this is the perfect format for Dr. Floyd mm -hmm. because we can deliver these episodes directly to the people and they can listen. So on November 7th, I did my very first, uh, we, we released the first episode via the podcast feed and it kind of really took off because at that time in, in the podcasting world, it was a lot of like, we can say whatever we want. So we're going to say whatever we want. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of very adult, very blue things that people were saying, um, which is fine. People can say whatever they want, but it's talking about the, their sex lives and talking about getting drunk and all mm -hmm. this other stuff. And, and then the other end of the spectrum was uh, one of the groups that really adopted podcasting in the beginning were like pastors and priests, and oh. they would record their sermon, which it makes sense if you think about it, they would record their sermon and put it out. So maybe you don't live near that church, but you could hear that pastor's sermon. Right. And so you had these two kind of extremes using podcasting at the very beginning. And then I think we came in like right in the middle where we were an entertaining show. We were a little bit more for kids. At, in the beginning, it wasn't kids listening to us. It was adults who were into podcasting. Yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of that. I was, I was one of the people listening. <laughs> I have a weird, similar way that I started. So I was getting into podcasting and while I was listening to it, I was trying to do cartoons again because one Christmas, I not only got the program flash for my computer, which was like, hey, you can create cartoons. I got a DVD of the first season of Rocky and Bullwinkle and I started watching that and I was like, oh, limited animation. I can do that. So yeah. I started messing around with it and started creating my own series. And while I was doing that, was listening to yours and it was one of my first like I'm gonna branch out and reach out to someone on the internet I'm like I want to animate one of your episodes and you're like okay try this one and so with that that that's first of all just backstory of how we sort of met but how did you get yourself out there in the sense that the first ep not the first episode the actual second episode that I did for you I mean you had stars on your show I <laughs> so how did you get yourself out there and meet all these people that you ended up having on the show? Yeah, well, and it's and it's unfortunate now, too, because uh, you did such a great job of the animation, especially that George Washington episode. But now it's like it's Jeffrey Tambor. I know. And Chris Hardwick. I can't even are, brag about it anymore. <laughs> I know. It's like, well, I got to remove this from the from the Internet. And I got to take, uh, you know, so, yeah, I don't put out those episodes anymore, which is a shame because it's amazing and it's so much fun. But it was, it, you know, it was just asking. And it was weird because certainly in 2004, 2005, because I think, yeah, that episode that you did was in 2005 and that like nobody knew what podcasting was. And my friend Mike, who is now a uh, he's the a supervising director on BoJack Horseman on Netflix. Oh, cool. I used to record audio for my friend Mike for because he would make little like flash animations and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I used to I used to record his audio for him and uh, he would bring whoever is doing the audio for him. And then one day he was like, hey, Chris Hardwick is going to come over and he's going to record uh, audio uh, for, for this thing I'm doing. You should see if you have like any part in, in one of the Dr. Floyd episodes that you're writing that he could do a voice for. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. And it just happened to be that same episode that Jeffrey Tambor was in. And so I remember very distinctly having Chris Hardwick standing in my living room in my tiny, crappy one-bedroom apartment in Burbank you know, and I asked him about it and he goes, OK, but what's a podcast? What is this podcast thing? Right. You know, like he had no idea what a podcast. He's the king of podcasting now. Yeah. But at that time I was like, oh, well, it's this thing where people can subscribe and blah, blah, blah. So it's it's totally weird. But it was just like it was just stuff like that. It was just, you know, Mike's like, oh, I'm bringing this guy over. You know, you should ask him. And for Jeffrey Tambor, who also had his issues recently. Mm -hmm. But my manager at the time for the comedy was good friends with him and would do all his 
like IT tech support in his office. And uh, she, oh, Jeffrey's a great guy. Would you all ask him if you want me to ask him, you know, like, and he said yes. And I drove out to his office and he was super nice. He did it. He, like Father Guido Sarducci, uh, Don Novello, you know, we got him on to, to play Galileo. And that was Doug just wrote him a letter, like found a P.O. box for him, wrote him a letter, and then he contacted us. And, I forgot um, you had Father Guido Sarducci on there. That's right. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of the first... I always say like the first celebrity to kind of be very into it and very do it was Frank Connor from mystery science theater. Mm -hmm. And that's just because I had done stand up with him a bunch and he was very like, yeah, sure. Let's do this. Let's, let's do it. We just got very lucky and it was just meeting people and asking them. And most of the people would say, yes, uh, some people would ask for money. I would explain that we don't really have a budget, but if right. you know, I tried to accommodate them as best I could. Uh, and the ultimate being, well, the, the two ones, that mean the most to me. I mean, everybody who was on the show was absolutely amazing and absolutely fantastic. But the two that really mean the most to me are June Foray, who oh, was yeah. the voice of Rocky the Flying Squirrel. Mm -hmm. And I went to like this premiere thing where they were showing all these shorts and June Foray happened to be there. And I was like, I got to ask her. Yeah. I'm in the room. I got to ask. I don't know who she'll be, but I, I got to ask her if she'll be on the show. And I, I went, she was waiting for her car. And I just said, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. But I do this show on the radio. It's like an old time radio show. I'm a huge fan. I would love it if you did a voice. And she handed me her card and she said, just call me up. And it was her <laughs> home phone number. And uh, I called her and um, she's come on over. And I said, well, we don't, you know, we don't really have a budget. And she said, this business has been so good to me. I love giving back. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that at all. Just come on over. Damn. And she actually wound up doing two little voices for us, which was, was really awesome. Just she's just a she was just a legend. And then the other one is Stan Freeberg to come full circle uh, to have Stan Freeberg on the show. He's amazing. He played Sherlock Holmes um, because mm -hmm. we were doing a, it was the season where we were jumping through books instead of jumping through time. And one of the greatest things was it, it, I just hit record on the audio and just because I was testing the audio and stuff. And he was kind of over there and, uh, you know, the other side of the table from me, just kind of chuckling. And I go. Uh, I said something that's like, oh, is everything, uh, everything okay? And he goes, this is a really funny script. This is really funny. <laughs> and like, that was like the greatest thing. I was like, oh, well, I can stop right now. Stan <laughs> Freeberg thinks my script is funny. That's oh. all I need to know. At the height of Dr. Floyd, and certainly not this way now, but at the height of Dr. Floyd, we would get like 80,000 downloads a month. That was probably like in 2007 or something like that. Uh, all but the very last season is up on like iTunes and Spotify and all that kind of stuff. And I would say like once or I, I would say at least twice a year, we get a nice little like $200 check, you know, for oh. all that stuff. Okay. Um, which in turn pays for another year of hosting, you know, another yeah. two years of hosting or whatever. <laughs> it's able to self-sustain itself and continue to live on on the internet just by regurgitating its own payment. <laughs> right, right. That's well, nice. and the, the other thing about Dr. Floyd and, and like a show for kids, and I didn't real, I didn't learn this until later, is that um, a lot of like PBS shows, uh, like Sid the Science Kid, which was a PBS show that Henson did, um, they did like 180 episodes. The way they would dole them out is like there'd just be one new one a week, but then like you know the new one is on Friday. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, it would be reruns. That new one would join the rerun pile. And then the next week, there'd be another new one, but they'd show it every day. And once they reach 180 episodes, most of the time on PBS, they go, that's it. Unless it's the show is like a runaway hit, like Sesame Street or something like that. Mm -hmm. They just go, that's it. Because now uh, we can recycle on those shows. Yeah. And every three years, the kids will age out of the group. Out of, out of the age range, mm -hmm. um, but a whole new group of kids will come into the age range. Yeah. So they don't need to keep making new episodes because they can just show these old ones. And that has certainly been true with Dr. Floyd. I get letters all the time from kids who just discovered the show or from parents and we love the show. We just found it. It's funny because sometimes they write and they think we're still producing it. So they're all, hey, for next season, you should do this. And I have to write back, uh, well, we're kind of not making it anymore, but. That's actually a really cool point, though. It's, it, yeah, with a particular genre like that, it is it is cyclical, I guess. That's, I never thought of it that way. The only thing I'm finding out now is that there are some episodes that are not aging well. There was a couple early episodes that were, looking back, they were funny to two 
early 20 year old guys who didn't you know have any supervision or anything like that <laughs> looking back i was like okay maybe that was not the best idea to do that and then you know i just got an email the other day because I, I still put out a new episode it's not a new episode but i still rebroadcast an episode so i just go back through you know like uh, season eight is about to start i think in february again mm. um and then once season eight is done i'll go back to season one and we'll just start all over again but there was a show we did it was a live show and it was north by north uh, north by north pole and it's the one that just went out like last weekend or the weekend before but somebody wrote to me and said you know like in this storyline uh everyone goes and runs and gets chips because they need chips the the character chips uh, the robot yeah um they need her to go to this thing but she's in the middle of celebrating hanukkah and you just took her out of her hanukkah party to go on this adventure and he was like i i know you have time and space uh <laughs> travel device and you can go back to any time and this person who was writing was like i'm a christian and i was kind of offended that you would just hmm. rip a character out of her hanukkah you know thing and looking back i was like well yeah, maybe that wasn't the best thing, you know, and I just, and I go, I'm sorry. And I go, but thank you for pointing it out. And, and maybe I'll, you know, I mean, that one's already out there right now. Right. It came out last week. So I, I'm not really going to take it off, but maybe the next time I come around to playing that one again, I might not play that. One. I put out a toily video every week on my Saturday morning media um, YouTube channel. Um, there's at least one thing a week that comes out. Sometimes there's more than one thing a week comes out. Um, or at SaturdayMorningMedia.com, there's always stuff that's coming out. But there's a new season of Mystery Science Theater on Netflix, mm -hmm. so um, which was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, it's only six episodes, so I think it's a lot easier. It's a great starting point. Yeah. If you've never seen the show, I think this current season is called The Gauntlet. It's a good season to check out. It's a good starting point. The, the coolest thing in the world was that the one-off character that I did last season, Joel brought back this season and he even got to go in the theater and do a few riffs. We did those six episodes in seven days, I think. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So, and it was actually, and I'll give a huge shout out to the puppeteer crew on that. I mean, everybody who works on that is amazing, but the puppeteer crew, well, we started with shooting the movie segments and they had budgeted in all this time where they were like, Oh, if the if the puppets are going to hold up a prop, or if they're going to in the theater, or if they're going to come in and do something in the theater, then we're going to have to have X amount of time to do that as a special insert shot. And we just kept going. No, we can do this live. Like we yeah. can do this. Like as long as we have the prop set, we can do this live, and you won't have to. And we were supposed to do three movies a day over two days, and the first day we did four movies. Oh wow! And so we were like a whole movie ahead by the start of the next day. And then we just went through those other two movies. So anyway, but it was a fun season to work on. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of good work and uh, I hope people will check it out. But you did like full on riffing in the live tour. So I did. Yes. I was, I was very lucky to be, I could never replace Hampton. Hampton is on Hampton Yount, who is Crow T robot on mm -hmm. the show. He is amazing. But uh, Joel called me up and said, um, you know, would you like to, to step in for Crow on the tour? And I was like, Sure. Yeah. Um, I was terrified mm -hmm. uh, because it really is a tricky thing to be watching the time code on the movie, watching your script, <laughs> yeah. moving your because we're, we're reading off of iPads. And it's kind of like this weird juggling act. But then you're also performing at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, watching the time code, watching the thing. And like, the, you know, during rehearsals, I was like, Oh, this is horrible. Like I, this is, <laughs> like, I am not being funny at all. Like for more, for that time, it was just like, I got to get the joke out at the right time. I'll work on uh, the way to say the joke and all that stuff. I'll work on that stuff. The first couple uh, rehearsals, I was really worried, but uh, then it came great. And then we did four, like 41 shows. In is that how many cities. it was? Oh my God. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> Kind of the project right now that I'm that uh, really has a lot of my focus and I'm hoping to make even bigger this year is my podcast called Under the Puppet, mm -hmm. where I interview professional puppeteers. And it's more geared towards it's kind of geared towards puppeteers in terms of advice from professionals. So you're like you're hearing professionals going, oh, well, this is how I handled that audition and stuff like this. And hmm. and my goal with that podcast is to not ask questions like, 
what was it like working with Jim Henson? Because <laughs> I feel like people are going to, well, what are they going to say? They're going to, it was horrible. Yeah. Like, but I would rather ask the question, I'd rather ask the question, what did you learn from working with Jim Henson? Like, mm-hmm. or what's something that Jim taught you that you still use to this day? So you get the stories that way. And we have interviewed a lot of like, or, um, you know, I've had a lot of great people on the show. Bill Beretta, who was the, the lead in Happy Time Murders. And the, the episode that went out this month uh, is Alice Deneen. And she's worked on Sesame Street. She's worked with the Muppets. But she was Bill's right hand for that character in Happy Time Murders. Okay. She was his assist the whole time. Um, so she is just as much that character as he is. Uh, Nina Conti who's an amazing ventriloquist from the UK. Definitely look her up on the internet. She's so funny. We had uh, Mallory Lewis, who is Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. That's her daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now she has taken over Lamb Chop. Uh, the, the one that was out in December was Paul Fusco, who created ALF. Uh, oh, yeah. Classic, you know, uh, he, was the, he was the creator and puppeteer of ALF. And he's, I will never not be amazed at his story about how he kept the rights to ALF after the show ended. I and didn't I, know that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's like that would never happen now. And it was just this totally lucky thing where he now completely owns Alf. Huh. Um, it's really amazing. So there's a lot of really good stories, a lot of really great interviews. And, uh, you know, if people are, even if you're just sort of tangentially interested in puppetry, you know, definitely, I mean, check out that one with Paul Fusco, the guy who created Alf. That's a great interview if people want to check that out. So yeah. underthepuppet.com, that's where you can go. <laughs> If you want to know more about Grant, I would say go to his Twitter profile, which is at ToasterBoy on Twitter, or visit his website at MrGrant.com. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com. The music for this episode is by my band Lorenzo's Music, which you can listen to more of that at Lorenzo'sMusic.com or search Spotify and iTunes for Lorenzo's Music. If you want to check out my animated series, you can head over to Amazon Prime and just search for The Adventures of Xylus and Dexter. That's X-Y-L-U-S for Xylus. Next week, I talk to an artist here in town who I've been following on Instagram for quite some time, and she happened to be making a mural for the university over here, so I went over there and had a conversation with her. Until then, so long. <laughs>